Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theater Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. Today's guest is a stage director, writer, producer, lecturer, and choreographer, and spent 18 years as the production artist, artistic director, and executive producer at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle, and because his work never ends, it seems, is the host of David Armstrong's Broadway Nation podcast. Let's welcome David Armstrong to the show. Hello, David. Hello, Jean-Paul. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on. Now, I start every one of my interviews the same way. We want to know who David is. So in 30 seconds, give us the David bio in 30 seconds. Uh, David Armstrong is somebody who's been obsessed with musical theater since he was five years old and was one of those weird kids that uh, started organizing the whole neighborhood into doing shows that I would write and produce and direct and choreograph and star in. And basically, except for the starring in part, that's what I've been doing for the 60 years of my life is, is exactly that, producing, directing, staging theater. Let me ask, well, take it back to that beginning. You obviously said you were you were into it since you were five. Were you the black sheep of the family or is, is it an artistic family that loves that type of thing? Uh, neither one, actually. It was not an artistic family in any way, but was strangely supportive of what I wanted to do and what I was interested in. So, yeah, there, there, no theatrical background in the family at all, but uh, liked it and, you know, didn't object in any way. So I think I probably had the best of both worlds in that, <laughs> in that way. And where did you grow up? In Cincinnati, Ohio. So Midwestern, uh, but, but Cincinnati is a really strong arts town, uh, which I don't know if people are aware of that, but, you know, has one of the oldest symphonies and ballets and all that kind of, all those cities that were settled by German immigrants in America, and I think in Canada probably too, have the longstanding traditional, longstanding arts organizations there. This is the, I grew up going to the Cincinnati Playhouse, which was, and then ended up working there quite a bit as well. So yeah, there's lots of arts there. And then the, they have one of the great musical theater programs of the country at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. And I ended up going there as well. Perfect. So obviously you were predestined to seem <laughs> to go into some For kind of artistic thing. For oh, some yeah. reason it was in my blood. Yes. <laughs> I'm always curious, in, in high school, before you decided to go to the musical theater uh, college, uh, was there anything else, any other job or career you were thinking about going, mm, you know what, I wouldn't mind doing that? The only other things that really caught my interest were archaeology, which I don't, which still interests me, and I'm still very interested in, I've always been interested in history, so I've ended up with doing a history of the Broadway musical podcast, is probably not a coincidence, but history has been a big uh, interest of mine and then archaeology. I thought about being an archaeologist uh, and strangely enough, a librarian, which is another very weird thing to uh, have. But uh, and still that the arc, the uh, th that kind of job, especially from in terms of doing research and stuff like that, is still very interesting to me. I love doing the research for my podcast. And the podcast is really a spinoff of a course I teach at the University of Washington for the School of Drama there. So that's been part of putting that course together, uh, I got to exercise some of my incipient librarian, uh, you know, uh, abilities. There's nothing wrong with being a librarian. And I kind of have to say that to myself because my oldest is thinking about going into library studies in yeah. university. So, you know, that's good. It, they're going to love it. That's all I know. <laughs> um, so you you went to the University of Cincinnati, you said, for, for musical yes. theater. Yes. Did you go for, had, for performance? I was actually in the theater department there just as the, and, and worked a lot with the, with the, in the musical theater department as well. Okay. And, and which stream did you get into? The, the theater or the, the musical theater? Yeah, at that time they were separate. They're now pushed together in one school. At that time, theater was in the Arts and Sciences College and uh, the musical theater program was in the uh, in the School of Music, the Conservatory of Music. So, but there was a lot of crossover. Nice. And what, is, what happened to you after that? You graduated, David is out. And what did he do? I actually got my equity card during, after my sophomore year at Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera, dancing in the chorus there. So I was a dancer. I also went to dancing school when I was a kid and, you know, dance was, that was my way into most things to begin with. 
uh, and then moved to New York actually uh, because I met some people who were in who had apartment who had room in their apartments and ended up uh, leaving school and going to New York. Nice. So, so you're in New York now, auditioning and things like that. Uh, do yeah. what was some of your first shows that you grabbed? We know very early on, even before, even during college, and uh, I was got more interested in directing and choreographing uh, than I was in performing. So even though I did perform early on, I made that transition really quickly, and I was very, very lucky because what you know how it is when you move to New York, then you might get hired back in Cincinnati at the professional theaters, which you wouldn't get hired for if you were still living in Cincinnati. Uh, and that's what happened. I ended up going to the university, going back to the Cincinnati Playhouse to uh, choreograph a few shows. And during that process, met a really talented director named Jack Going, John Going, who was had one of the big regional theater careers as a director at that point. He worked constantly for 40 years. He just went from one regional theater to the next all across America. And we hit it off. He really liked me as the choreographer. So I ended up uh, sort of riding his coattails for a little bit. And I'm 19, 20 years old at this point, 21 during these years. And I ended up choreographing all across the regional theater circuit in America, based in New York. But And then those theaters, after they got to know me as a choreographer, they would offer Jack a job and he wouldn't be able to do it. And they'd offered me the job to direct the show. So I had a directing career in a pretty major way by the time I was 21 years old. So that was pretty lucky and amazing. Wow. Once you, once you started directing and choreographing, choreographing around the, the nation, uh, were you still uh, performing or did that kind of take the back, back seat now that you were doing this? That almost completely took a back seat. Yeah. At that point. In fact, it's only in recent years that I've started to perform a little bit, at least by doing live lectures and singing a little bit in those lectures and those kinds of things. Do you, do you find it weird? Because the same thing happened to me. I, I transitioned from performer to well, everything else. And thinking about going back on stage, it seems kind of weird. Uh, was, it, was, it, was, it, was it a weird moment when you, when you started performing again and singing in front of an audience? And... Totally. Yeah. I, 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 it's, it, but it sort of happened gradually because I started having to do a lot of public speaking as the, in my job at the, at, uh, the Fifth Avenue Theater. So that's, and then we started doing events where I would host these events and I'd be the, and uh, the, which sort of were like, you know, fancy lectures basically with singers and, you know, and they'd be sort of previews for what was coming up in the shows. And then eventually I started taking on more and more of the, uh, at least a little bit of the performing aspect of that. It never goes away, does it? It's always there, <laughs> that, that tickle and that need. Exactly. And I thought it was completely, I really have, and I still don't really have an interest in doing eight shows a week or, which is why I didn't, you know, I was always more interested in being on the other side of the table and, 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 and also more interested in the creation of the show. Mm -hmm. I love the rehearsal process. I love the tech process. I didn't love the performing having to do it eight times a week for weeks at a time that yeah. didn't interest me so much it's funny when you realize that you you it's you love theater rather than you love being on stage at the theater and it doesn't matter right. what part you are right that's exactly right so let me how did you get from from being a 22 year old choreographing and directing things around the nation and then uh getting to the fifth avenue in seattle what was that that progress well i had for about 20 years i had a fairly successful career as a freelance director and choreographer, uh, including some shows in New York. And uh, in the middle of that, I for, spent three years in Albany at the Cohoes Music Hall, which is a small little professional theater at that time it was. It's the, old, well, the third oldest theater in America in terms of the building, oh, wow. really charming little space, sort of like a working class good speed. So it has, it's on the third floor, just like the good speed opera house is, but it was in a, from a working class community, not quite so upscale as that. And so that was dipping my toe in the artistic director uh, aspect of that. And it was a great learning experience. And then I went back to freelance and uh, started writing quite a bit in that period. And that was also really fun and really successful. And actually my, uh, 
my big dream right now is to get back to a way that I can write again, just have the time and the wherewithal, because you really have to sort of, at that time, I sort of stopped directing entirely and just focused on writing, which is the way I need to do it. I know people write things, you know, before they go to school in the morning and, you know, write a great novel and they're on their spare time. I don't know how they do it. I need to have like a clean slate to do that. And then the job, I got a, a job uh, directing a production of The Secret Garden at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle in 1999 and went out there just as they were starting the search for really their first artistic director, producing artistic director. They had been working with uh, Theater Under the Stars in Houston as sort of outsourcing the artistic aspects of the, of the theater to them for the 10 year period before that. So it just was really fortuitous to be there at that time to do a show that went really well and everybody responded to. And I threw my hat in the ring and I actually thought I was the least likely person to get that job and ended up with it a year later. Uh, I was there at the Fifth Avenue as the producing artistic director. Wow. It's, it's, it's just like kismet that, you know, you happen to be there and that happened to be happening. And then who would have thought 18 years later, you, you know, you would be in there still. I had never been to Seattle before at that wow. point. Yeah. No idea, no even thought of moving to the West coast or taking, although I was certainly interested in that job because I knew that there was tremendous potential in that theater in Seattle at that moment. Yeah. And, and, and Fifth Avenue is known for a testing ground for new musicals. Um, how did that, was it always like that or did that come about, uh, you know, under your tenure or, or how does that work? I'm happy that to say that was, that was a result of my initiative. Uh, when I got the job at the Fifth Avenue, I got hired, but I didn't actually start for about six months to about six months later. I didn't move to Seattle. So during that period in when I was still in New York, I, every Broadway producer that I knew that I would run into, I would say, I'm going to Seattle, I'm going to be at the Fifth Avenue Theater. I think this would be a great place to try out a show. Let me, please keep us in mind. And I guess I just was, uh, kept doing it enough that about, I don't know, two months or three months after I got to Seattle, I got a call from the producers of a show that turned out to be Hairspray and saying, we'd like to bring, we like, we have a new show and we don't know if you'd be interested, but we want to talk to you about it. Wow. And that was the, it was really the second show. We'd done another new musical prior to that that was, you know, moderately successful. But this was, uh, put us on the map once we, once we produced it as being a place to, um, to, create new musicals in partnership with the Broadway producers. And in fact, Margot Lyon, who was the lead producer on that show, went back to New York and unbeknownst to me until later, basically told everybody that she was never gonna try out another show anywhere but the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that put us on a path to do, we put it on a path sort of in tandem doing, doing pre-Broadway work but also developing new musicals from scratch. So during the time I was there, we did 21 new musicals in full productions and nine of those shows went to Broadway. So if you would ask me to predict what we were gonna do when I got to the Fifth Avenue, I would say, I, if I'm here for 20 years, I would be thrilled if one show, if we did one show that went to Broadway <laughs> and we were able to do 10 new musicals on this scale over 20 years. And so just the track record turned out to be phenomenal. That's incredible. And, and it's such an inspiration and, and people should learn from it that are listening that just ask, like all you did was ask to say, hey, we, we'll do this here. And you know, yeah. if you don't ask, it won't happen. So good on you for just, you know, taking the initiative and saying, hey, come on over, we'll do this. and. No, you're right. It was just putting it out there and putting it out there repeatedly and being a little bit of a nudge and saying, you know, this uh, and, you know, and then being able to, you know, bring all the forces together to make it happen, which frankly was challenging. We had never, you know, the theater had never done a new musical, had mostly done touring shows to a great extent prior to that. So it really meant retooling the organization to be able to take on this kind of work. 
So you said you developed some of them in house as well. Some of the new yeah. works. I'd love to know, uh, you know, some of them that, you know, whether they made it to Broadway or not, because I, I I've always been a, a, a believer that no matter whether it's hugely successful or just smallly, smallly successful, it, it deserves recognition and deserves yeah. uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the positive vibes that these creatives have uh, put out there. So I'd love to learn about some of those shows. Sure. A number of the shows I'm very proud of, but one great example that did go to Broadway and has been produced a lot, it was a Christmas story, the musical version of Christmas story, which we uh, created. I mean, most of that show was written. The songs were all written in the basement of the fifth Avenue theater during the, during the year before we produced the show. So, uh, and we had a, we uh, hired the songwriting team to make that show happen. And it was a really great process. We sort of took a uh, page from the way Garth Drabinsky had done, uh, found the team for Ragtime originally, which was commissioning, paying a small amount, and we could pay a lot less than Garth Drabinsky could pay, uh, to uh, songwriters to create a few songs you know, to, on spec in order to find the right team. And we had some great submissions. We had about six teams submit. And we ended up taking a chance on these kids, Ben Pasek and Justin Paul, who were 25 years old at the time, to write the score for A Christmas Story. And uh, this was in partnership with a, a guy who owned the rights to A Christmas Story as for the theatrical rights to it. And we put it on sort of a fast track, a faster track than we would have, I think, otherwise, just because we knew the, we would always do a big holiday show. And this was, we knew this was going to sell well. So we, we could, we didn't, it wasn't quite as risky as some other new musicals might be in that regard. But we put, the, we had the guys come out to Seattle and put them in the basement and force them to write songs. And uh, we ended up, <laughs> with a great show. And of course they've ended up with an incredible career. Now I'm trying to picture them being forced into the basement <laughs> to write, sitting at desks well, and piano. I, I say that just because, and I find this with a lot of writers in yeah. their left to their own devices in their own worlds, mm -hmm. they're very busy and it's hard. They were having a hard time getting together and collaborating and finding the time to do it. But if you can get them out of their they're you know out of New York in this case and isolated in yeah. Seattle where they don't have anything else to do but write songs they could write a new song a day I mean yeah. they were they were they were fast actually but they just had to have the time and the focus to do it and that really worked distractions are the killer of art <laughs> <laughs> exactly so what other shows um you know like I said big or small came out of there that you that you really enjoyed <laughs> I have so many. I mean, we partnered with Disney on Aladdin on the the world premiere of Aladdin. So that has been a ongoing pleasure just to see that show happen. And one of the things I was really uh, we have this incredible theater community in Seattle. It's one of the few I would say there's, you know, only a few theater towns in North America. There's New York, there's Toronto, there's Washington, DC, there's Minneapolis, St. Paul, and there's Seattle. Those are the theater towns in North America. And there may be a few more in Canada that I don't know about, but uh, what I define a theater town means that there's, a, there's enough theater, professional theater companies that you then have a talent pool of actors, singers, dancers, musicians, directors and choreographers that don't have to go to New York to uh, in order to successfully have a career, at least uh, on some level. And we were blessed with that in Seattle. And I sort of knew that all that was sort of underutilized. And we kept uh, promoting and developing and utilizing the talent pool here more and more over the years I was here. And I'm happy to say that almost every one of the shows that we sent to Broadway took Seattle-based Seattle, Seattle cast members with them to Broadway because they were just that good. And they were became instrumental to that show, to those shows. Wow. So that was one of the things I was really proud of, was just sort of celebrating the 
Seattle-based incredible talent pool we have here. It, it must be so um, uh, heartwarming to see so many people um, and so many shows succeed and, and move on and grow and, and take them to the next level. And frankly, we wouldn't have been able to do those all of those new shows if we didn't have the talent pool we had, because that was part of the way we could develop these shows uh, cost effectively at a lower cost than could happen in New York or other places. Because we would, you know, the original the world premiere of Aladdin in Seattle had not, the majority of the cast was Seattle based. Mm -hmm. And Disney was very skeptical about that, but then, and Casey Nicola, who was the director, but then fell in love with the cast and three of the principals from Seattle went to New York. What do you think it's about Seattle? Is there something in the water and the coffee and like is? I think it's it's a little bit of the, the number one, it's far enough away from New York that people don't necessarily think about, I and I'm going to move to New York because mm -hmm. it's about as far away as you can get. Uh, so there's that's part of it, but I think it's also because there is this. There's five major theater companies, and then a whole host of mid-size and small theater companies, although less than there used to be at this point. We'll see where we are when we come out of the pandemic, but hopefully things will be better. There's uh, and there's a huge audience for theater here. It's a and that usually has to do with levels of education. I mean, the one is when we did market research and everything for the Fifth Avenue, what we discovered over and over again was what made a theater goer was a high level of education. Uh, coupled, you know, usually when you do the demographics, also people who have uh, have high levels of income. But we we looked at that and thought, I don't think that's necessarily those two things have to go together. And we did an experiment with that with a uh, with school teachers, teachers, we did an initiative where we offered and we progress, we promoted this heavily to every teacher in the Washington state, basically saying we have uh, orchestra tickets, best tickets in the in the in the theater for twenty five dollars as opposed to the eighty dollars or whatever they would usually be. Uh, if you you know participate in this you know club basically so you're like a ticket club and what we found and they we sold thousands and thousands of tickets that way because the teachers then came to the theater five times a year rather than one time a year and so it was had nothing to do with income it only had to do with with education and exposure to it to had to knowing what it was and that's why we instituted so many uh youth programs, kids programs at the Fifth Avenue of all kinds over the years, uh, because the other research we would find is if you expose kids to theater when, when they're in grade school or high school, uh, they will come back. But if they have not experienced theater, it, you know, I'm sure it's true of ballet or opera or anything else during those years, it's almost impossible to get an adult who didn't go to the theater at, at least a few times as a kid to come to the theater as an adult. Yeah, it, it, it just, it shouldn't surprise me, but it just surprised me how, how many kids have never been to the theater. I know my kids, <laughs> you know, they, they go, they've seen so much, so much stuff, but then sure. they talk to their friends who've, you know, their first time is, you know, when they're 15 or 16, I'm like, Wow, it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. So yeah, it's great on your, your, the company for doing that and implementing that. And it was all part of the same sort of ideas, like how do we maximize the impact of what we're doing here of musical theater? Great. So let, let's take 18 years in, in uh, Seattle at the, the Fifth Avenue. What, what, was, what made you decide to, to step away from Fifth Avenue? It just, you know, it's it's a hard to it's hard to uh, pin down exactly. And I it once I decided to do it, it happened a little faster than I thought it would, which I think is not unusual. It was I just seemed like it was time I was uh, not that I had done everything I could possibly do, but I had done a lot of what I wanted to do there. And, you know, people, I don't think always appreciate that the leadership jobs at a arts organization are 
incredibly challenging, incredibly uh, enervating, really, really uh, stressful. These are really, really stressful jobs. And knock on wood, I wish I didn't have a crystal ball, but somehow not being in that job at that this particular moment was the best decision <laughs> that I ever made in my life because it's only gotten more stressful as now artistic directors and managing directors need to make health decisions, public health decisions yeah. be, uh, that they are completely not trained for or uh, you know prepared to do. So it was that, it was just basically, I felt like it was time to move on. Once we made a decision about what was going to happen after me, which was to uh, uh, promote the, uh, managing director and the um, my uh, associate artistic director to sort of reconfigure what they were doing but move them up into the job i was doing then i felt like well how long do i make them wait for this job you know i'm going to say okay here's what's happening but you got to wait two years that just didn't seem like the right thing to do so it meant that i ended up uh, leaving the job a little earlier than I thought I thought I might make it to 20 years or almost 20 years, but ended up like that doesn't make sense. Let's let's just do this now. No, that's really why it, it just was the right time to do it. Did, did you have a, did you have a plan of what you wanted to do or did you just want to take a, a moment to exhale and, and regroup? Yeah, I didn't really have a plan. I uh, felt that uh, you know, I had had a very successful freelance career prior to that. So I thought that was always a possibility. Although of course it turned out to be almost time for no one to have a freelance career because there weren't any jobs for anybody. So that part didn't work out. Uh, I knew I wanted to write and I thought I wanted to teach. So those were two of the things and teaching was the thing that came up first with the University of Washington approached me about teaching a course and I pitched this idea of uh, the course I teach is called the Broadway musical, how immigrants, Jews, queers, and African-Americans invented America's signature art form. And then I had to make the course once they said, that's a great idea, let's do that. So then I spent about a year, uh, not quite, uh, researching, preparing it, and I had never taught on the university, not really taught on any level as a professional uh, before that. And so I had to figure out how to create a 10 week course uh, for the university, which turned out to be really, really successful. I'm teaching it uh, right now, we're in, in winter quarter. We have a hundred students in the class. Uh, so it's a big lecture class. We're online currently. We're supposedly going back into the classroom maybe next month. We'll see. Yeah. We were supposed to be in the classroom, of course, the whole quarter, but no one feels like we should do that. Uh, that then, when we got to the pandemic, led, I had already had this idea that I could take that idea of this, of the course I was teaching and create a podcast out of it. And I had started falling in love with podcasts. I really started listening to them. And so I could do that, especially history podcasts. So once the pandemic came, that sort of uh, inspired me to, if I start making these podcasts, I can use those as part of my course since we can't be in person. And so that sort of, jump started the podcast and I started releasing the podcast, these episodes, or I do a version for the class and then a different version for, for general release. And so that sort of started, that's how I got to the podcast during that. And now I'm 51, 52 episodes to today. We'll release an episode 52. I've listened to some of yours and I, I could never do these type of podcasts. <laughs> the ones where you have to actually you know, do the research and write it out. And then that is so much work. I do not envy you. <laughs> How do you find the well, time? <laughs> I have to say I'm lucky because I had to do the research to teach the course. True. So I was double, I was repurposing things, which I've always been a big fan of <laughs> repurposing anything you do and trying to put it on multiple platforms, I guess, is that I sound really hip, don't I? <laughs> well, and, and, and how do you choose your topics and, and what type of topics do you cover in, in the podcast? 
Well, the first season, basically I do, I go through the history of the Broadway musical in chronological order to a great extent, sometimes not exactly in chronological order because I'm dealing with different topics or different subject matter, but basically that's what it is. And now in the second season, I've been going back and revisiting aspects, you know, going more, going more deeply into certain topics, but now don't have to do it in chronological order. So in a way, it's sort of what interests me, what uh, also I'm doing more interviews in the second season. So a lot of that is on who's writing a new book about uh, some aspect of the history of the Broadway musical. And that sort of, you know, those come to me to a certain extent, rather than me having to seek them out. And those are really fun because I get to read the books and, you know, uh, which I love to do. There's the librarian again. Yeah. And then talk to the authors, which I love doing as well. So uh, I'm just about to, I'm working right now doing the research, back to the research sort of like I did for the first season and for the course on what I'm calling the other Broadway, which is the, all of the hundreds of nightclubs and speakeasies and things that were surrounded that were in the Broadway district in the theater district really for from the 20s to the uh, to the fifth through the 50s that in many ways are really when people talked about Broadway or reported Broadway that's what they were talking about all of the songs lullaby of Broadway and give my regards guards to Broadway are about the nightclubs and that whole world of Broadway, not about the sh not about the legitimate shows. Mm -hmm. And there was this great, you know, crossover between them. But it we've forgotten that we don't think about that anymore because those nightclubs don't exist, and it isn't this sort of that world of guys and dolls, which of course is really about the twenties, not about the fifties. The, the stories were written about written in the thirties about the late 20s basically uh is what people most of the time when they're talking about broadway during the history of broadway were talking about the broadway shows were part of it as well but that wasn't the broadway scene that wasn't what they meant when you know uh when they're singing lullaby of broadway it's all about the 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 nightclubs and the speakeasies and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm re uh, researching right now. That's very cool because we all know, you know, the, the surface stuff. It's, it's the iceberg thing. We all know what we can see, but there's exactly. so much below that uh, that we need people like yourselves to <laughs> remind us there's other stuff. Yeah, and I didn't really know much about it. I just started got through other research, I started reading, you'd read the biography of somebody and they talk about their experience in the nightclubs. And it just started adding up for me that, oh, this is a whole world. And my uh, frequent co-host Albert Evans pointed out that those songs, when you listen to the lyrics of any of those songs, they're not talking about a Broadway show at all. None of them are. They don't, they're, they're talking about this whole other world. Wow, that seems fascinating and really interesting, and uh, I look forward to uh, <laughs> hearing this yeah. in, in the future. Yeah, within the, in the this season's coming out. I'm in the middle of it right now, so I can't <laughs> predict exactly how many episodes away it is. So let's let's talk about the, the present and the future. You're obviously really busy. You're 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 creating the podcast. You're you're teaching. Is there anything else that you have that coming up, or, or that you want you want to talk about? You know, that those are two the the things that are uh, occupying almost all all of my time right now, uh, and you know uh, as you know from podcasting, it is a, you're a one man band. It is, <laughs> yep. and you know it's sort of great in a way because there are no rules and there's no bosses and there's no nothing to tell you what it needs to be, yep. but at the same time you then all the responsibility falls on you to create it, to edit it, to market it, to put it out there, to try to get someone to listen to it. And uh, that's been, you know, fun to a great extent, although it does make you do some things that you wouldn't ordinarily do in terms of, uh, I was never wanted to be in charge of marketing anything, but, uh, <laughs> As the artistic director of a theater, I got heavily involved with marketing and, you know, some of those skills are paying off for me now, but of course, online is a whole other world. 
Yeah. Is there any skill sets you learned uh, during the pandemic that you didn't have before that that you've now obtained? Yeah, I mean, it's a sort, of, sort of a combination of the pandemic and just taking on the podcast. I mean, to me, the biggest challenge is just all the software that I have to yeah. learn how to manipulate at this late stage in my life <laughs> uh, <laughs> that I just was not all these programs that I, I know not, I now know how to do that, you know, I wish I never had to learn, but are very useful and are necessary and need to happen. And, you know, I'm from the generation I, we didn't, I, we had, they introduced electric typewriters when I was in high school. So only, we only had three in the, in the, in, in the typing, uh, program at my high school, there were three electric typewriters. So the everything to do with, um, you know, with, with computers and the internet and all this stuff came during as an adult for me. Yeah. So that's all stuff I had to absorb and learn and grow. And I, you know, have, have done it, but it, I, I, I'm not sure that younger people appreciate the challenge that that is for uh, people who didn't grow up with that. Yeah, I forget who I was talking with that um, when I was writing my essays back in whatever elementary school or whatever, I had one of the old school typewriters where the 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 arms would get crossed if you type too yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, uh, keyboards are so much easier. Than <laughs> Man. So that's, I mean, the pandemic and the podcast have pushed me to so much, you know, I now design graphics on Canva and I do all this stuff, which is, you know, second nature to, to the young people, but uh, it's been a, it's been a bit of a challenge. And I, for all that stuff, it goes in one ear and out the other. So every time I go back to it, I feel like I have to learn it all over again. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> so how, how do we, how do we find your, your podcast? It's, you can find it everywhere that podcasts are uh, found on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Stitcher. Really, it's on every every platform. It's called Broadway Nation. And uh, be thrilled to hear from people. I also have a very, very uh, active uh, Facebook group uh, related to the podcast. We've got almost 2,000 members in the Facebook group now. And we have a tremendous amount of fun uh, again, dealing with issues of Broadway and Broadway history, and uh, it's very participatory and uh, really turned into a really great community. So people can find us uh, there uh, and as well as on any other social media, but the uh, Facebook group is the most sort of vibrant thing that's happening in terms of that right now. Fantastic. Uh, David, thank you so much for coming on. But before we go, I always ask yeah. my guests three questions. Okay. There's no, there's no right or wrong answers, but people might judge you. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there's I'm better wrong. answers and worse answers. There's exactly. There's no right or wrong, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> the first one's easy. So this, this was a nice a lob ball. Um, what creator or team within musical theater has had a great influence on you? No, it could be a composer, lyricist, director, producer, actor, even a stage manager. It could be somebody famous or not famous, like a teacher. Is there somebody who's had a, a big influence on you? I've there been, that's a hard one because there I could offer so many. I know. <laughs> but I would say, I'm going to say Bob Fosse, who I never met personally. Uh, but from certainly from from high school on, maybe even before that, I was aware of Bob Fosse and his style and his choreography. And one of the very first shows I saw on Broadway was Pippin uh, when I was about 15 and blew me away. That original production of that show was so staggeringly amazing. Uh, and it was all about, I mean, he was the star of that show. And I like that show very much. I think it's very well written, but Bob Fosse was the star of that production, even though he was not on the stage. Uh, his whole persona, uh, you know, pervaded the whole show. And it, the conceptual things he was doing, it really is a concept musical in so many ways, especially uh 
really influenced me. And of course, like all young artists, you start off imitating people and then you absorb those things. And hopefully if you're good, you make, you find your own voice, but you still have the influences of those people. So I would say Fosse was one of the most influential people on me. Very good. Can't go wrong with a, the answer is Bob Fosse. <laughs> right? there's, no, there's never, that's never wrong. So one point, correct answer. So okay, question number one. You. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. All right. <laughs> question number two. And you were at Fifth Avenue for 18 years, you said, involved in, in many new musicals that were produced there. Is there one that you thought deserved more recognition than it got? It, it just, it should have taken off, but it just didn't for whatever reason that you think, you know, more people should know about. Yeah, uh, this is a show that didn't go to New York. We did a, a new musical based on A Room with a View, the E.M. Forster novel, which was um, had which was really quite wonderful in so many capacities. The it we never quite got a chance to finish it. The authors didn't. Uh, it was one of the shows that almost got there, that 90% of it was good. But frankly, like so many shows, the, the, the conclusion, the ending of the show, the final events of the show were just very elusive to try to figure out the best way to put those on the stage. And so that one has, I, I guess to answer your question, it, it didn't get the recognition it should have gotten, partly because it didn't ever quite achieve, and maybe if it had one more production or one more chance, it would have found that. Uh, this was already this, we did the second production of the show and got so much further than the first one had. So it, it's one of those, like the show that got away, I feel like that that had so much potential to be great. And it was really good and had moments of greatness in it. We just, I would love to have had a chance to do that show one more time and have people really see it and uh, have it get the recognition. I think it, the the sad thing about so many musicals, I teach every year at the um, at the university at the uh, what am I trying to say? New York University, the Tisch School yes. of uh, Music, for their musical theater program to so the sophomore uh, class. Uh, on story structure, I do a story structure lecture over there. And I always talk about these amazing, these shows that so many new musicals that I've worked on in my career that will never be seen again because for whatever reason, the creators of the show were not able to find the final elements that they needed to really make it work. And yet they're filled with great songs and great moments and genius songs in some cases. But they, because the story couldn't, wasn't, didn't really work entirely, the shows, you know, end up not moving forward. There's so many what ifs or could have beens out there. And, and it's, it's sad, but you know, that's, that's life in general too. It's totally, yeah. yeah. So. It's just that all, every one of those shows had great songs in them. Some of the best songs you've ever heard, but yeah. you'll never hear them again because the show isn't, didn't, work enough to support them it's, it, i find it so unfortunate that so many songs like that are lost through, from time and yeah uh, and and that's what i love honestly i love playing that sort of thing on the radio station the right. the ones that people you know don't know about or will be lost unless somebody you know right and you get a chance to play the ones that got recorded and then just there's just so many <sighs> Uh, that only have demo tapes or something that somebody should send to you so you could play those as well oh, because yeah. some of them are sound like cast albums but they're whole you know shows that nobody knows about yeah and sometimes it just needs that one person to hear it and then want to yeah. take it off and but oh, yeah <laughs> it's, it's the frustrating part of our our, our lives and our, and our careers and our jobs uh correct answer so one more <laughs> point um now the third question, the one people might judge you on. Well, again, other people, not me. Um, food in the theater or cell phones in the theater? Which is worse? Cell phones are worse. Uh, food, I don't like food in the theater. I don't feel and food, the need for food in the theater myself. But you know, when you go to London, they have they everybody eats all the way through the show. They sell the they sell food in the theater aggressively now in yeah. London, or at least they did before the pandemic. 
And um, one of my favorite things about going to London is ice cream at intermission. <laughs> so that I entirely approve of ice cream being sold in the aisles at intermission. In fact, I tried to institute that at the Fifth Avenue and everybody would fight me on it. I'd be like, they do it in London for, they've been doing it for years. It, it's not gonna create a mess. It's little yeah. cups, it'll be fine. But everybody was just terrified that you would have <laughs> ice cream at your seat in the theater. So, but cell phones are horrible. I'm not sure what we're gonna do about it. Uh, I don't, I think the only thing that could happen and there's probably liability about this, but is some kind of thing that would block them to just turn them off, yeah. you know, on mass for everybody. Uh, but those are horrible. Yeah. yeah, no cell phones. Agreed. Agreed. I would have also accepted they're both terrible, but uh, you still got the right answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations, three out of three. Uh, I got no. Prize, I win. But you, you win. You got bragging rights. Now you can go to all your friends and say, I don't know what you would say, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. again, uh, David. Thank you so much for coming on and, and telling thank us a little you. bit about yourself, your career, uh, the Fifth Avenue, and, and how that went, and your podcast. Um, again, people should check out if they're interested in in Broadway history and musical theater history, definitely check out your podcast. Thank you so much. I look forward to, to uh, hearing what everybody thinks about it. Awesome. All right. We were just speaking with uh, David Armstrong, the, the creator of the podcast, Broadway Nation. Please turn in next week as we'll have another guest or guests to talk about their life, love, and passion. That is musical theater. I'm your host as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you.